Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Compute Data webinar. We're coming to you from Ocean Headquarters in Berlin. Uh, I'm here with uh, Summer <laughs> and Alex, Santiago, and Trent. They're joining us uh, remotely. Just uh, for a test, if you can hear me properly, please leave a message. Uh, we'll wait a second for Trent to also join us here. But I'll give you a quick uh, overview of the agenda and what we're doing today. So uh, Ocean V2 is our computer data release focused on uh, unlocking private data. And in this webinar, we're going through the overall architecture, where it fits with all the other approaches. So Trent is going to talk about that. And then Alex will tell us about the architecture. Also, will show you how it is to set up a backend and connect to uh, Ocean Compute to Data V2. And Samer here next to me will show you the data science interface using JupyterLab. Um, we would also love to invite you to uh, join our ecosystem. There are a couple of ways. You can join uh, our <coughs> developer forum at port.oceanprotocol.com and post any ideas or suggestions that you might have. And also, uh, right now, uh, this webinar is also going to be shared with participants of Git Exchange Hackathon in partnership with Radical Exchange and Gitcoin. We have two very interesting, relevant uh, to compute the data uh, bounties there. Each of them are around like three, four thousand dollars in Ocean tokens. So we invite you to also uh, join that hackathon. I'll just quickly type the name and I'll share the link later. It's called Git Exchange on Gitcoin. Uh, we'll tell you more about that. And then in the second part, uh, uh, one of our community members, Santiago, uh, who is also a winner of our previous Data Economy Challenge. He will show you a demo, which looks really cute and pretty, uh, with nice pink colors. And um, after that, we will have an open Q&A session. Uh, you can always also use the Ask a Question uh, feature on your screen to ask a question. Uh, there's also a bit of crowdsourcing, so to choose the best questions. Um, alternatively, you can also post your questions on this side or this side in the chat box. I'll be there to talk uh, to you guys. And uh, right now, let me find Trent and add him to screen so he can start with the keynote. Okay, I find Trent7625. Inviting you to screen. Uh, Santiago, I'll momentarily remove you and I'll add Trent and we'll be back uh, with you in the second part of the webinar. So Trent is joining us. Hi. Yes. Nice sunny day, Trent. Yeah, yeah, I'm sitting outside of the cafe right now. So you should be seeing as Trent now. We can start uh, any moment. Okay. Uh, great. Yeah, I guess you can hear me and so on. So yeah, I'll just get started. I decided, um, so this will be about um, 15 minutes long and I'm not going to have slides. I just want to talk uh, verbally about um, three specific things um, with you guys to kind of set the stage. First of all, you know, um, why are we trying to unlock private data? What, what's the goal there? Um, and how, what's the rough idea of how we do it? So that's the first. The second thing is, um, how does what we are doing relate to other approaches for preserving privacy? And third is basically, you know, many of you in this call are developers and interested in building on Ocean. And there's a few, you know, given that this technology for Ocean computer data is quite young and quite new, um, there's a few things that I personally would really like to see just um, sort of demonstrated some flows and I'm just going to go through a few of those flows. They're basically various hello worlds um, of increasing complexity. So uh, hello worlds in, in a machine learning sense. So with that, um, I will get started. Uh, by the way, if you guys are, are curious, I'm based in Berlin right now. And so Berlin is lots of nice and green and the cars going by and people around and I'm sitting outside, so I don't have to wear a mask, but if I was inside, I would. So that's why you guys can see a little a bit of the mask marks. That's not me being tired. That's from the mask that I was wearing the last two hours. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I've laid out the three, three things I'm going to talk about. So to start with, um, motivation. So overall, you know, uh, the mission of Ocean itself is about uh, unlocking data to help level the playing field um, for you know citizens more generally, but specifically for AI practitioners, so that um, all AI practitioners can really help to access uh, data. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in a big company or a small company or your own individual. You can just access data. And um, you know our V1 release was about um, a data access control framework to, to do that, where um, it's basically replacing the role of the cent centralized middleman for access control. V2 um, is about computer data, and it's uh, about helping to unlock private data, helping to level the playing field for private data. Um, so, and then the question is, uh, why private data? And what is private data? So there's a lot of definitions, but a, a pragmatic definition. Oh, by the way, check this out. Um, so uh, that, that's a, a German size street sweeper. It's small enough to go on the sidewalk itself. So I love these things. I'm from Canada, so everything is big in Canada. You know, we have giant combines and giant trucks, but I love these little things here in Germany. Uh, anyway, back, back to uh, the motivation. So private data, our definition is simply data that people or organizations keep to themselves, AKA keep private. And it can be personal information or personally identifiable information you know, medical information, lifestyle, financial, sensitive, or regulated information. But basically, it's information that people are motivated to keep to themselves. Um, and so why would we want this private data for AI and ML? And the reason is, um, generally, uh, more data means more accurate models. Uh, or, in some cases, it's even, um, you might not have had any reasonable data before, so you're just, uh, it unlocks totally new, news new use cases. And to quote um, a fairly famous hedge fund person, um, the best data is more data. <laughs> so, um, so basically, and you know, Google wrote a famous paper in about 2006 called "The Unreasonable Effects uh, of Data," which is riffing on a famous math paper about the effects of math from um, in the 50s. Anyway, uh, so how it can help, right? Um, specifically, um, it can lead to life-altering innovations in science and technology. Um, for example. Um, as well as um, that's from the, the science side, right? So in health and in um, other science, just more data is really helpful, astronomy, all of this. And then from the business side, um, private data is often considered the most valuable data simply because it's so hard to get at it and using it can lead to potentially big payoffs, right? Um, so we know there's benefits in private data um, to use it um, if you're an AI person and so on. But uh, of course there's big risks, right? Why is it that people aren't using you know, private data all the time. And that's because um, sharing it or selling it comes with risk, right? Uh, for example, uh, you, maybe you share it or sell it and it prevents you from getting hired, maybe because of some, you know, sensitive medical history or because of other choices you've made or simply because you were born and all this. And, you know, it's super uncool. Um, and, uh, you know, it's already happening um, in, in many ways where we sign up to the Facebooks of the world and we say yes to the terms of service um, where they're basically saying, yeah, we have the right to access everything, everything, which is really uncool. Um, and, you know, part of our goals is to, you know, to help people give much more fine contr grain control over what data they share to whom, right? So if you eventually, if you want to share your data to Facebook, part of the vision of Ocean is great, but you're going to sell it to Facebook. You know, you can choose to, to share it, to sell it or for whatever benefits, but it's much more fine grained and you can choose what you sell or what you share. Um, so that's, uh, you know, one of the things, and then within, you know, I talked a bit about individuals, but large organizations too, large enterprises are very reluctant, right? Um, because they know that their data sets are valuable and potentially monetizable, but, um, they have, uh, basically big risks, um, because of the data escaping and related liability, right? So if we think about things like the Equifax hack and so on, this is data that they were trying to keep private but then it got hacked and it got exposed. And of course that data is about many of their customers, hundreds of millions of their customers. So that's the risks of private data. So we've got, you know, this trade off, right? On one side, we, need, we see great benefits to private data and the other side, great risks um, of private data. So how do you um, resolve this, right? And the status quo basically is you either, um, you know, don't try to access at all or um, big organizations take advantage of, take advantage of people and um, make people click through and say yes to the um, onerous terms of service. But there's a there's a better way, right? Um, there's a way where we can get uh, resolve this trade off to get a lot of the benefits um, and minimize the risks, right? And that's um, the idea behind compute to data. So the core idea is 
let the data stay on premise, yet allow third parties to run specific compute jobs on it to get useful analytics results um, like averaging or building an, an AI model or otherwise, right? And you know, these analytic results still lead to positive outcomes in science, technology, business, yet the compute is sufficiently aggregating or anonymizing that privacy risk is minimized. So I'm fighting with the, the noise here again. Um, in this case, he, he came to visit me. Check it out. So, oh, he stopped it. It's a child in the way. But uh, I love these things. <laughs> so. There we go. Maybe he came because I, I was talking about it. Anyway, I'll, I'll keep going here. Um, all right, so that's uh, basically, uh, you know, the benefits, um, you know, we, we see there's benefits of private data, we see there's risks, and uh, to resolve this trade-off, the whole idea is to let the data stay on premise, yet aggregate it just enough, um, such that um, that uh, that private data is not exposed, and you can still build uh, AI models and otherwise to get the business benefits. So so that's the first part, um, and uh, Nima, um, I, I should just continue, or should I stop for questions or anything? What do you think? Um, if you have more to say, we have about like five more minutes for your part, but it's up to you if you want to take questions okay. or we should, uh, you know, up to you. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I, there's more I want to say, so maybe I'll, I'll send, spend two or three minutes on that and I'll have two or three minutes for questions. Um, so, um, basically the second part is a, a lot of people have been asking, um, how does our compute to data approach relate to other, um, approaches out there? privacy preserving approaches. And so there's a lot of approaches, uh, you know, a lot of them come from the crypto world originally for privacy preserving. Um, so there's things like encryption, decryption, um, homomorphic encryption, uh, trusted execution environments, multi-party compute, zero knowledge proofs. Um, so the ones I just listed, um, all of those are technologies that are um, quite complementary with Ocean and they sit side by side with Ocean. And I have a blog post that, that relates. It's one of the most recent blog posts that we published. So if you guys want, you can look into the details there. And there's actually some other um, uh, ones too. So um, where basically they play, they can interoperate much more closely. Um, so things like uh, approaches like that include differential privacy, synthetic data, and federated learning. So, um, and the blog post also elaborates on um, how these approaches play well together. There's also another lesser known approach um, called decoupled hashing. And um, I, a friend of mine, Adam Drake, invented it, and he's actually an ocean advisor too. And so he wrote about it in a blog um, a couple of years ago. So I actually updated the blog post recently to include that because I think it's pretty cool. It means that there's, um, you don't even, uh, basically the compute side is uh, doing less compute and making uh, the data sort of anonymized, yet at the same time learnable. And then it can be brought to the, um, to the model L learning side that, that can stay si client side with the AI practitioners. So that's worth exploring too. And I think it's pretty cool. So the blog post talks more about that. Um, and uh, the final thing just to mention is um, uh, there's some flows that I'd love to see um, uh, built uh, in Ocean. And maybe I can even simply copy and paste this into the channel, but I'll just mention them. In fact, I'll mention, I'll copy and paste them. And, um, and then so those of you who are maybe interested, um, I uh, can, it's complaining my message is too long. One second here. Uh, <laughs> there we go. So Thank I just, you. Uh, the, the first message is on a single silo. The second message is on many silos. So basically um, in machine learning world, the hello world of machine learning is essentially logistic regression. Um, despite its name having the word regression in it, it's actually classification and it's linear classification. There's a few ways to do linear classification, but logistic regression is as simple as the rest, basically. And so um, that's that's one of the key ones that I'd like to see, where it's just, so to start with, just do log logistic regression, where um, there's modeling at the data side. Um, and then uh, even simpler than that is just doing simply averaging at the data side, just to show the flow end to end. Um, and then we can get a bit more complicated doing neural networks. Um, you know, they've, uh, but it's not that much more complicated to do a simple neural network um, if, if it's not deep learning and all that. And then also the final one is the decoupled hashing, which if you can do logistic regression or the neural network stuff, then you, you, it's pretty straightforward to figure this out. And I, I elaborate what that is in the blog post. Um, and then on the second part, um, it basically takes the list above on the first part 
and um, says, hey, let's do this across several data silos, right? So an average across many silos, and I lay out the algorithm for that. Um, basically, you, you take the sum across, for each silo, you, sum, you have two outputs. You have the total number of samples and the sum across the samples. And um, you basically take those outputs from each data silo, and then you tally them up in the final end for the overall average, right? And you know these are big. There are big use cases in this. You know, uh, we've talked with a lot of folks, um, including CTOs of cities, um, where they they say that they have trouble just doing simple BI business intelligence across their different departments in the cities or even provinces and stuff, right? So things like averages and other simple statistics can be very beneficial, even though it's so simple, right? And then also logistic regression um, with decoupled hashing, and then also federated learning across many data silos. So uh, those are some of the things we um, I personally would love to see, and probably more too. And by doing this, it helps to just demonstrate, um, you know, simple things in a single silo and um, multiple silos, as well as a simple ML case, logistic regression, a fancy ML case with uh, neural networks, and finally the decoupled hashing use case, which I think is a very interesting flow uh, as well. So yeah, uh, that's that's it. For, and I guess I will stop here. Thanks everyone for tuning in, and I will see maybe if there's questions, you know, a couple minutes of questions here. Uh, can you hear me, Trent? Yep. Okay. So we have an interesting question from, I think, uh, Stefan. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we had a call, actually. He's a PhD student uh, working or at least thinking about uh, different staking approaches. So uh, very cool stuff. And he is asking, um, how do you guarantee or test that the data has been aggregated just enough? as you say in the blog post, before leaving the premise? Or whose responsibility is this? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. And um, there's a, a few answers. Um, there's basically clear, trustworthy answers, clear, um, untrustworthy answers, and shades of gray in between. So um, basically, with things like an average, if you have, say, more than 10 or 20 data points, then you know for sure the average isn't going to leak information, right? Um, for things on the opposite extreme, if you do a machine learning model that overfits, like let's say doing a cart model that um, learns down to leaf node for, for every single data point, then it's almost certainly going to leak out PII, right? So that's um, definitely um, not doing enough aggregation. And then there's shades of gray in between. And where, where is that cutoff? Um, it's uh, not clear. I'll, I'll be honest, right? But um, the it, the decision is up to the data provider. So it's up to them to make a judgment call for whether a given script or algorithm that's running on their side um, will leak PII, right? And so you can go better than just simple averages. You, for example, um, think an average across more dimensions in a sense is a variance of linear regression, right? And linear classification. So those in general are going to be quite trustworthy, as well as, um, you know, a good rule of thumb, I think, for higher levels is. Um, where you have just a, a simpler model that um, had, has way fewer parameters than, than the number of data points, right? So it's aggregating in that way. So th that's uh, the, the pragmatic answer. There's one other piece of theory that's really useful here, and that's differential privacy. So differential privacy, actually, it's pretty cool. It gives guarantees that you are sufficiently aggregating. So if you're trying to do a machine learning model, um, even with a fair, fair degree of complexity, like let's say random forests and stuff, with, which do a lot of um, you know high fidelity stuff, if you will, or deep learn neur neural network, um, you could actually change it where the inputs are uh, leveraging differential privacy, which means basically randomizing the inputs of it. And if you randomize them enough, and there's theory to support how much this is, then you will get guarantees that the information doesn't get leaked. So that's pretty nice. Um, you know, I think it's probably it might be overkill, but it's a pretty good set of steps that can be done in the near term because then it helps to give good guarantees. And over time, people are, are going to learn. Um, yeah. So I guess to summarize, it's a really great question. Um, the good, um, a, a really useful thing here is that the tr the seed of trust remains with the data provider. So they make the judgment call on what to trust. As time goes on, um, there's going to be I anticipate there's going to be more and more algorithms that people have demonstrated that are trustworthy or that have you know built in differential privacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, that's going to be helpful as well. Yeah. And uh, Trent, I think we could say there are probably two approaches that are very compatible with us. One is, uh, let's say, frameworks like, for example, PyGrid that are pre-approved uh, 
within a community or a framework. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that the guys at Open Mind are working on. Another approach is if the data is really complex and it doesn't fit any, with any standard frameworks, they might have to work with data scientists or experts in privacy preserving machine learning. And I actually have a database of these companies. I think we should publish it somewhere soon and uh, connect with those different uh, kind of dev shops and experts in privacy preserved machine learning. So then they work with data providers and then they set the assurance uh, levels for what they're comfortable with sharing. Um, uh, yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a good point in the open mind, you know, open mind started off with, you know, just decentralized federated learning, but as probably many of you know, it has generalized to a more general project about um, helping with privacy preserving ML across the board and really bringing first class software, um, mm -hmm. many of these various techniques. And I think that's that's super helpful. So um, lots of room for collaboration with open mind technology. Yeah, uh, one more question. There's probably more, but uh, for you, Trent, uh, there are some of them that maybe Alex can answer. This one is from, I think, Joe. Uh, thanks, Joe, for your question. How would new businesses interact with Ocean Protocol? Will the interface be declarative or code heavy for businesses using this? Could you repeat the last sentence? Would the interface be blank, blank? blank? I, I think they meant if the interface is like a GUI, uh, or they have to code themselves everything. So what what is, the, let's say there's a new business that has data or they have uh, interesting data sets that they want to share, but they don't have in-house data science or machine learning capabilities. How would they work with Ocean Code? Right, so um, I guess, uh, great question. And um, there's, uh, I'll just describe Ocean products and then uh, work from that. So Ocean essentially, had, the project has two products. One is uh, the platform, which is the L1 smart contract and the L2 libraries uh, to, to use those contracts and to make it really easy. And this is for, um, yeah, so that that is really targeted towards developers, of course, right, at that level. Um, and then also, though, in addition to the platform, we have the marketplaces um, technology. And this is basically building blocks for people to build marketplaces. So we work with companies to um, iterate with them to help them deploy their own data marketplaces, such as we've announced with Dextray and there's more in the pipeline. Um, you know, it can be small companies, can be large companies and so on. As well as uh, we've also uh, announced that we will be rolling out uh, our own uh, community marketplace, so Ocean Market. And that um, basically will be independent of any given single uh, third party marketplace. And so, uh, Basically, uh, people can uh, submit data directly to that, um, and, and you know other you know forms of monetization there, right? There will be opportunities for referrals and a referral program curation, all of this, right? So, if you are basically then to answer the question, I'll just point to some of the things I've mentioned already. Um, if you don't have developer abilities, you could work with us um, to help roll out your own third-party marketplace. And as Ocean Market comes along, then you can also be putting um, data for sale in there, or, you know, buying data and then cleaning it up and putting that cleaned data for sale, or doing referrals or doing curation or any of the other value adds where you can earn uh, through Ocean, right? Um, yeah, so those are the ways. There's one more question. I'll uh, try to answer it. Um, so it says, is there a possibility of attacks if you send fake data to corrupt the model? Uh, the thing that's interesting about Ocean is uh, you can, you as a developer, you can create uh, a, an app on top of Ocean Protocol that has features that uh, work against us. For example, you could have a rating for data providers. You could ask them to stake some amount of some currency. It could be Ocean tokens or other things. So they have skin in the game. Uh, and, and if they do things like trying to attack, uh, they get punished or they get griefed and they would lose their stake, for example. Trent, do you have something to add? Yeah, I can add this more specifically. So I, I guess I should state, state out Ocean is not censoring any data. So if you publish you know, sp um, spam data or crappy data or garbage data, um, so be it, right? Um, and it's going to be there in uh, different marketplaces, community marketplace, whatever. Um, but um, then it's you know a question of discovery. And when people do discovery in marketplaces, there's a few different ways, right? There's three typical ways, which is searching, browsing, and filtering. And so um, marketplaces that do a good job will help the high quality um, 
uh, data sets bubble to the top and the lower quality data sets remain obscure. And this is not unlike, you know, Google web search or whatever, right? Um, but then, uh, so if you just publish a bunch of spam, like towards NEMA, like what signals can you add to help um, the, the high quality stuff come to the top? And so as part of the, the Ocean V3 token design, um, we have, um, uh, it'll be going to the marketplace where you have to uh, stake if you want to do referrals. So the more that you stake, the more you can earn from referrals. And the same thing for curation. So the, um, so the more that you stake, um, then the more you can earn from data sets that, that get sold when you're cur curating. So you only have a limited amount of Ocean tokens to stake. So um, you want to deploy that stake in w places where you think it will be the most uh, profitable, right? So um, do you think that garbage data sets are gonna get bought and sold? Well, if people buy and sell those garbage data sets, then, then that's not garbage anymore, right? Sometimes one man's garbage is another man's treasure. So, um, but generally, if things truly are garbage, then no one's going to be buying them, right? So overall, um, by having this staking signal that is directly, you know, how much you earn from staking is a function of how uh, much that data set is bought and sold, then it automatically does the filtering. And it's sort of like your own predictions. When I stake on a data set, I'm predicting that the data set will be popular. And so there's this positive feedback cycle to bubble up the, the useful data sets, the higher quality data sets. Uh, so, so yeah, it's definitely um, on the curation angle, like Nima mentioned, but we are building some of this directly into the ocean marketplace technology um, just to help facilitate people with their own marketplaces and to help bubble up, you know, high quality uh, data sets. Thank you, Trent. Uh, so I hope you stay with us in the comment section here or here. Uh, and now we'll uh, move to the next uh, section with Alex, uh, our VP of engineering at Ocean Protocol. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, Hey, Alex. Hey. Uh, do you want to show your face for a second? Or, or uh, are you an AI? <laughs> no, I, I'm an AI. OK. <laughs> or, or, okay. Or, or at least just for today. OK, OK, yeah. Trent uh, programmed all of us to work with him and create the ocean. So yeah. uh, Alex, I'll minimize myself. And you can start your presentation. Uh, okay. And we're quite on time. Thank you. Okay, so uh, time to, to go deep in the architecture. And uh, first of all, we need some key concepts and definitions. So let's talk about uh, the unique IDs that are present in, in Ocean. So every asset, doesn't matter that it's an algorithm, a data set, a computer resource, has an uh, associated uh, ID, which is called decentralized identifier, or also known as a DID and a DDO, which is the descript descriptor object for that DID. Uh, why we are doing this? Because uh, an asset without a proper description has no value. So if I'm going to give you 1 million uh, files with uh, unique ID names and without any other information, that's probably is garbage. So uh, a DDO document is composed of the standard DDO attributes and some services. And we have the ID, the creator, the public key, the proof, and the services. Uh, talking about services, so uh, each asset can have multiple services associated. So we can have, for instance, the metadata service, which is describing the asset, the provenance service, uh, which is describing the asset provenance. Uh, we have uh, a consume service for data assets that can be downloaded or we can have a compute service for data sets that uh, can only be computed on top. So this is how, how a DDO looks like in a, in a friendly manner. Uh, we have the URL. Uh, we, are, we are going to talk about this later. We have a name. We have a description, an owner, price, uh, sample files. And uh, the big difference uh, from other DDO descriptors, uh, you can add any information that you want we have a special attribute for that it's called additional information so you can add licenses categories uh, gps data uh, fuel consumption whatever you want uh, and that will will help in your asset discoverability uh, as uh, trent was uh, was mentioning earlier we have uh, three layers in our architecture we have the 
uh, L1, which is the network level, the L2 component level, and the L3, which are the dApps. So let's talk about uh, level one. Uh, we are running our own POA network, which uh, uh, is composed with some validator nodes and some secret store nodes. And also on top of that, we have a bunch of smart contracts. Uh, for developers, uh, we have three networks. Uh, the first one, we are uh, it's called Spree. It's a local host development. Uh, we have also the Nile, which is our test network. So you have faucets for gas and ocean tokens, which are for testing only. And we have our main network, uh, it's called Pacific. And we are using a token bridge to transfer the ocean token to and from ETH mainnet. Uh, so in this network, you don't have any faucets. Uh, I, I was mentioning the smart contracts. Uh, here is a small overview. A bunch of smart contracts and all related to one uh, each other. So uh, yeah, again, Trent was mentioning that also uh, Ocean does not handle storage uh, of the files to avoid data custodianship. So you will have to provide the URL of the actual data. Uh, right now we are supporting uh, multiple backends, uh, AWS, S3 buckets, Azure, on-premise, Dropbox, G Drive, IPFS, basically everything that has a new URL can be used in, uh, in Ocean Protocol. But we have the URL, we, we need to encrypt it because the metadata is public, so we have to encrypt the, the URL first. And how are we, are we doing that? By using the Ocean uh, Secret Store, which is the, based on parity EVM, uh, it has only one job, to store a fragment of the encrypted URL, uh, and never, never one single node can decrypt an URL. So you need to have a consensus of several nodes in order to get the, the real URL. Uh, metadata. Uh, we need a way to store metadata somehow. Uh, so that's why we are using Ocean Metadata Storage, also known as Aquarius. Uh, it's typically run by a marketplace or other dApps. And uh, it's just an HTTP API server, so you can implement it in any other language. Uh, right now, it's written in Python using Flask. And on the backend side, uh, it can use various implementations like MongoDB, BigchainDB, Elasticsearch. Uh, also, we have the Ocean Proxy, uh, also known as Brizo. Uh, that's the only component uh, that should have access to your data. Uh, it has one major role, uh, and that is to perform checks on chain for buyer permissions and payments. And once these conditions are fulfilled, uh, the browser will decrypt the URL and will uh, stream the data back to the consumer. It will never stream the URL, just the, the content of the data. And of course, we have the libraries. So working with Aquarius, Brazo, smart contracts could be a, a pretty difficult job. So we have the libraries, also known as squids. Uh, we have JavaScript, Python, and Java. Unfortunately, the Java version is uh, unmaintained for now. And uh, yeah, probably you are going to use them. Uh, you only need a few lines of code to publish your consumer data set. Uh, our marketplaces are built built on top of Squid, so, and this is the, the complete architecture right now. So we have the provider on one, one side who has the data and it's running the, uh, the Brazo. We have Ocean Protocol with, with the nodes and the smart contracts, and we have the uh, metadata storage, which is uh, Aquarius and OceanDB. We have the libraries and we have the developers could be a publisher, consumer, a marketplace, or any other dApp. So uh, let's let's trust, let's try to, to describe a, a published flow. So you have the data, you are the publisher, you have the URL. And using Squid, uh, you are going to call Brazo first, and Brazo is going to return an encrypted URL. And then you are going to fill up the, the DO with all the metadata you that you think it's necessary, 
you are going to publish it in the metadata storage. And after that, you are going to register your asset on chain. Of course, uh, registering an asset on chain uh, could uh, could seem a little bit uh, over-engineered uh, because it's hard to, to keep data on the chain. Uh, but we are not storing the entire metadata on chain, uh, only some parts like the uh, ID, uh, the checksum of the DDO, so we can know if uh, if it was tampered. Uh, the URL of the metadata storage, the owner, and the access list. This, these are the only things that are stored on chain. Everything else is stored on ocean metadata, metadata storage. So that was the publishing flow. And now let's try to discover and consume data. For discovering, it's super simple. You are just going to use a, either the library or you can query Aquarius directly using its API. And you can query, give me some fitness data. And you will get by some results, some DDOs. And let's say you, you found a, an interesting data set and you want to, to consume it. <clears throat> so you are going to inform Brazo. I want to buy data set with ID 123. And Brazo is going to, to check. Uh, do you have the rights to access the data set? Uh, did you sign the service agreement? And uh, after the, the preliminary checks, uh, Brazo is going to inform you. You need to sign the service agreement and you have to pay 50 oceans. You are going to do the on-chain transaction. It's just a simple tra token transfer. Uh, you have the, the address from the Brazo. And uh, Brazo will keep uh, looking on, into the chain and uh, it will see the payment. So uh, as soon as the payment arrived in the escrow contract, uh, Brazo is going to stream the data back to you and never the URL. And after that, it's going to, to signal the fulfillment of purchase to the escrow contract. And the escrow contract can then handle any disputes or it can just transfer the funds back to the publisher. Uh, so that was, uh, let's say, V1. Uh, the, the simple flow of uh, publishing, uh, searching, and consuming data. And uh, let's go to computer data, which is far more interesting. Uh, again, I, I will not talk about the reasons. And to run a compute on, on an asset, you need two things. You need the asset, you need the algorithm, and you need some uh, attributes which are describing the, the algorithm. So you have, uh, yeah, let, let's talk about the algorithm asset. It's very similar to the data set assets. So you have a file, and but in, uh, in that file, instead of the asset itself, you will have an algorithm. And in the metadata, you are going to, to de describe all the attributes, like the image name, which is a Docker image, uh, its version, entity points, and other requirements like, uh, I don't know, do you, uh, do you want to use a GPU or not? And uh, how are we, we going to accomplish that? On the provider premises, we are going to, to have a Kubernetes cluster that is very, very close to the data. And you, as a, as a data scientist, let's say you are searching for data sets. Uh, you found a really nice data set with uh, some good samples, and you can start working on your algorithm using the samples. And uh, let's say it's going to take you, I don't know, two days, and you're happy with your algorithm, and you want to, to run that algorithm on top of the data itself. Uh, you have two options. You can either publish the algorithm to the Ocean Network, so anybody can use it, or you can just uh, drag and drop the code to a new UI like our marketplace. And the flow is almost the same. So you are going to inform Brazo. I want to run this algorithm. Could be a low code, could be a published algorithm on, on a data set with ID, uh, let's say, 4.6. And Brazo is going to, uh, to do all the checks again. Uh, is your algorithm trusted? 
or if it's a raw code, are you allowed to run raw code algorithms on this data set? Uh, is the consumer trusted? Uh, the service agreement is signed. Uh, did you pay? And once all these conditions are fulfilled, uh, Brazo is going to spin up some, some pods in the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, first, it's going to, to provision the pod with data and algorithm, uh, control the network access, uh, which is uh, the feature that the publisher is going to allow it or not. Is going to run the algorithm and then up, uh, upload the output and logs to the storage. And as a data scientist, you can always uh, check your job, and you will always get uh, a response back. Uh, is my job still running? Yes or no? Uh, it's finished. Uh, do you have the URL for the algorithm logs and output? Uh, or you you always have the possibility to. Uh, publish the output directly into the ocean network. And of course, when, when the compute job is finished, you can look at the logs and the output of the algorithm and decide uh, if it works for you or not. Um, yeah, so uh, let's go to the compute data backend. Uh, this is a simple flow. Um, so you are the consumer. You are going to install Brazo. Let's start the job. Brazo is going to do all the uh, on-chain conditions, and then it's going to call the operator service. And uh, the operator service is going to uh, create a custom workflow inside the Kubernetes cluster, which is going to be handled by the operator engine. And uh, once the, the job is started, uh, it will uh, signal the operator service uh, his status, uh, some IDs, and uh, it, it will keep track of uh, time uh, because as a publisher, you can always um, have a way to, to kill pods that are taking too much time. So let's say that you are going to allow only pods that uh, doesn't run more than one hour. And uh, yeah, one, one more interesting feature. Uh, inside uh, the cluster, you can have several namespaces, uh, each one with different characteristics. Let's say we have the Ocean Compute namespace, uh, which is going to allocate uh, two CPUs and one gig of RAM for uh, each uh, job. And you can also have an uh, Ocean Compute GPU namespace, which is going to allocate eight CPUs, uh, four gigs of RAM, and two super cool GPUs uh, for each job. And that is up to the provider. And of course, the provider can uh, uh, set a, a specific price for each type of jobs. And again, this is a flow. Uh, Brazo is going to instruct the operator service. I want to start a new job without GPU. The operator service will create the custom resource in namespace. And the operator engine uh, is going to pick up there are some event handlers there on new job, on finish, and on delete. So once we have the job created, uh, there are some few steps. Uh, it's going to create the persistent volumes. Uh, there are three volumes for each job, input, output, and logs. Uh, it's going to create some config maps. Uh, it's, go it's going to start the configuration pod with the input volume and that configure pod is going to get data and the algos. And then we are going to start the algo pod, uh, which will have the input volume as read only, just for, for safety. And uh, you have the output and the logs volume, so you can always use them as a, a temporary disks. Uh, remember that everything it's, uh, any file that is in the output folder is going to be stored and published. And once the algorithm uh, is finished, uh, then the pod publishing uh, pod is going to be started. Uh, and that will take all files from data outputs and data logs and upload them to, to the storage. And after that, it's going to signal the operator service that uh, this workflow is done. And you, as a data scientist, uh, you can know about it. Again, this is the same explanation with uh, some. It's the same workflow. 
Yeah, that was pretty much. I hope I did it in time. Uh, if Nima, I'm sorry. No, no, thank you, Alex. Uh, so I just want to also ask everyone, because this is a limited session, we'll try to keep it to two hours, uh, that they go to either port or if they want quick answers, they go to our Discord channel. I, uh, there's like a call to action, like a huge green button on the screen. If you click on that, you will directly go to our uh, server on Discord. Uh, there's a channel called Get Exchange Hackathon, but you can also ask your V2 related questions there. So Alex is there, Manon, every, all of us, we're also on Discord. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, there are a lot of questions for you. Uh, after you, we will have uh, Samer, who's going to focus more on the data science flow uh, mm -hmm. with Jupyter Lab. Uh, but here are a couple of more back in the question for you. Um, okay. For example, this one is asked actually by two people. Um, let's say I have a, it's from, let me see, who is it? From Casimir or Casimir. Uh, let's say I have <clears throat> my super nice special damage detection model. I publish it in Ocean as an algorithm asset, I assume. Uh, how is it prevented that someone just copies it once they have access to the pod? And then there is a similar question from Robin uh that's asking how do you ensure that the algorithm that computes on the data is kept safe i think open mind are working on in this direction are you cooperating with them so the, both of both these questions are asking kind of the same okay so the the only entity that has access to the pods uh is the publisher so mm -hmm. basically you 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 have two ways you can either trust the publisher or uh, you can use something like uh, intel sgx Mm -hmm. uh, which is going to encrypt your algorithm and then nobody can can decrypt it. Uh, mm -hmm. The downside of, of this is that your publisher needs to support Intel SGX, which is kind of expensive. I see, I see. And uh, there's actually a project, they're renamed from Enigma to Secret Protocol. This might be an interesting uh, integration between Ocean and uh, Secret Protocol or Enigma. They're working on trusted execution environments or, for example, Intel SGX. But can, Alex, can you explain a little bit more? So within the pod, that that uh, environment, it's hosted by the data provider, right? Yeah. So the compute provider is the data provider. Yeah. OK, OK. But there is a possibility to have like a neutral middle ground that the compute provider could be not the same person as the data provider, for example, if there's a federated learning, uh, let's say, alliance, you could say this party is neutral, it's in the middle, it gets the input from all these different uh, data providers, but then the actual compute is happening in this you know, environment, which mm -hmm. is not controlled by any one of these data providers. Yeah, we are thinking about this. Uh, uh, the downside of this is that you need to trust that third party compute provider. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they will have access to the data. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. again, it's your choice as a provider. I see, I see. Okay. So there's uh, another one. I think <clears throat> there are also technical approaches to this. Uh, I know there's a split learning is also now integrated with Open Mind. There are probably things that maybe we're not aware of, but uh, please feel free to. Um, comment the links to different, let's say, approaches that you might know. Uh, there's another question, but I think we answered it. They're saying, I don't think I understand where the compute is being hosted. Is it scalable in case you need more compute power? Uh, yeah, after all, the Kubernetes, by definition, is a scalable cluster. So mm -hmm. it's only limited by your processing power. If, if, you, if you have enough servers or you are using a cloud provider, then you can mm -hmm. scale it. Got it, got it. Uh, Casimir, you commented something. Uh, maybe can you provide a little bit more detail about you know what you guys are doing? Maybe we could uh, help you. Uh, but he's saying that about the you know algorithms being exposed, that the SME companies ask them, but the data or model remains in our control. And... Uh, what they're saying is usually it is 
a give and take with them as you like you say we got to host it with the data provider so mm -hmm. i guess this this is something that uh, every project they have to kind of come to some agreements about what they feel comfortable with yeah basically uh, you have two sides and mm -hmm. uh, neither of them are willing to to let the other party see their data because the algorithm is just a data yes so yes. so after all somebody has to trust the other party somehow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> got it got it so casimir please uh get in touch with us maybe we should do like a follow-up uh about your projects it sounds very interesting hope we can be helpful uh another question for alex maybe we'll have like seven minutes for these questions um can the original user negotiate with what price they want to sell their encrypted or anonymous data or is it gone and up to algorithms after azure uh no the the price is set by the publisher uh, mm -hmm. We support dynamic pricing, so the publisher can change the price, I don't know, every minute or every hour. So, mm -hmm. it, again, it's up to the publisher. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Uh, this one, it's, I think, from Laurent. Uh, how can one explore the data before launching a full-fledged <coughs> full algorithm, I guess, the whole pipeline? There are often issues that require adjustment to the algorithm when running tests. For example, a non-anticipated special character, malformed data, text instead of a number, you know, and such things. So I guess they're asking, could you do like tests on samples of the data set, maybe on the structure, some of the lines before uh, paying for the whole access? Yeah, absolutely. So every data set has uh, um, a custom section, which is called samples and it's up to the publisher to provide some samples. And also we are thinking maybe we can have a way to, to get a sample of the private data set. So mm -hmm. let's say uh, you have a big data set, like, uh, I don't know, 20 gigs, and maybe we can have some kind of sampling and mm -hmm. you can use that. Could be an idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, again, here, we, we had a chat with the guys from Enigma back then, and um, I think John had this, one of the co-founders had this idea that you could do a very small, limited amount of compute on a sample of the data set, a random mm -hmm. sample, within an Intel SGX environment, and then check the outputs only. Uh, so that could be maybe also a solution. Yeah, yeah. But again, maybe you, you have bad luck. I mean, if you have a data set that is uh, one gig mm -hmm. and the last two lines are having some kind of a problem, like, a, I don't know, something wrong, uh, mm -hmm. your algorithm will uh, work great on the sample, but it's going to fail uh, when doing the compute on the actual data set. But uh -huh. this is this is why you, as a data scientist, you can always access the logs. So you can look and you can fix the algo. Of course, you will have to run it again, but mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. So I'm going to invite uh, Samer to screen. Let me see. I see a lot of familiar faces. <laughs> Let me see if I find Sam. Oh, okay, Sam4891. I hope this is our our Sam. <laughs> so, um, Alex, thank you for the presentation. I think we will have more questions. Please uh, stay with us. Yeah, yeah. In the comment section, also you can, uh, you know, uh, we also click on this link. Go to our Discord. Uh, we would love to see submissions to this hackathon because there, are some of the questions that you guys are asking are uh, in the uh, bounty description. For example, we have a data bounty uh, as a bounty, and then we have algo rank, which is about uh, assessing the quality of algorithms. So one of them is focused on data. Another one is focused on uh, algorithms. Hi, Samer. Bye, Alex. <laughs> Bye. Uh, hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, Sam, do you want to share your screen? Uh, there is like a share button somewhere on top. Let me know if you find it. In the meantime, uh, <clears throat> uh, please feel free to ask your questions in the ask a question section and maybe address them to Alex Trent or Summer or myself. Happy to help. I don't see the how to, how to share the screen here. Mm -hmm. There's a share uh, link on the top, but it might be me, that. It shows me then share oh, the no. event. No, it's not that. You're in the office. So I'll just come help you, okay? <laughs> okay. Just a second. So I'm going to find Summer. So. Okay. Uh, Samer, can you also uh, tell us a quick intro about what you're going to show? Uh, yeah, so we have uh, we have a data science, uh, well, a Jupyter Lab uh, instance running uh, on our servers, and this is to allow anyone to uh, to play out to play with our uh, uh, existing uh, code. So we have a few notebooks uh, in that instance. Uh, for exploring how to publish a data set, how to consume. And uh, recently, we just added another one for uh, trying the compute uh, service. Um, so if you go to datascience.oceanprotocol.com, mm -hmm. this is the interface. Then you have to log in to that instance using your GitHub account. And for me, it's not going to go through that because I'm already logged in. It's just loading the instance. Got it. We should just uh, share a very small warning. This is more like a demo environment. It's not supposed to let you do really heavyweight, you know, computing here. And your uh, pipelines might uh, get errors, or you might run out of time. Uh, but but this is to show that you can set up such an environment yourself. Uh, yeah. So here you can see the notebooks that we have uh, prepared. And now I'm only going to show the compute to data uh, notebook. And to make it short, uh, I'm going to skip all the introduction stuff on top and dive into uh, executing the, the cells here. Uh, so as was mentioned by uh, Alex before, um, we make have use of the squid uh, libraries, and those are uh, the libraries that we built to uh, interact with the lower level and uh, other services in Ocean Protocol. And we have a Python, JavaScript, and a Java version. Uh, so here, of course, we're going to use the SquidPy uh, library. So here we just need to import some things that we need to use, um, including in SquidPy, there is also a Brito uh, interface to, to communicate with the Brito instance. That's the provider proxy. Um, so let's go through this. Uh, now we can create an ocean uh, instance. The ocean instance, and we're loading the configuration from uh, from a file. And here I have already uh, set up a, a faucet uh, URL. And this is a service we have running that allows you to request uh, 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 Ether uh, into your account. So you can, uh, uh, so you can uh, make use of the POA network, uh, uh, the Nile network, which is just a testing uh, a blockchain network.
And this one here, we were just setting up the provider address. And this is required to be to enable Breatho to, uh, uh, to access the, the, the data sets or assets. And of course, we need some uh, Ethereum accounts. So we need two of them, one for the publisher, one for the consumer. And this call will automatically uh, use the faucet to request Ether. And then we can uh, request also some Ocean tokens. If the publisher doesn't need that, uh, only the consumer will need it because the publisher is not going to buy any data or services. And this one is just for the consumer account. And again, populate with some Ocean tokens so they can make use of the data service. And you can see here the balance of uh, the ETH balance and the Ocean tokens balance. And now we can uh, see the interesting stuff. Uh, we need to publish a data set uh, with a compute service on that. And as mentioned by Alex, I think he mentioned that, that uh, you can have uh, an access or download service and you can have a compute service. Um, so here to, to include a compute service with the new assets, uh, we need to define uh, all the attributes that are required by that compute service. And we've divided that into multiple different uh, calls. Uh, for each different section to make it easier to digest. Uh, so there is stuff about the cluster, uh, the server, and this is gathering all together. And uh, the endpoint for uh, the provider service, the Brito proxy. And then we can uh, create uh, a service descriptor, which is used in the uh, in publishing the um, the asset to actually create the, the complete service uh, uh, object or JSON uh, document. So let's go through this, and I'm going to grab a metadata example that we have. You can see the complete example in the repo. And this is the call to create an asset or register it in Ocean. This will do both uh, registering the asset in uh, uh, on chain in the smart contracts in the in what we call the DID uh, registry, and and it will uh, publish uh, the metadata or the complete DDO that includes the metadata and the services um, in the metadata store, uh, which we call Aquarius. We're using all Ocean related names. Um, So here we would see um, the registration is successful uh, on chain and also uh, in Aquarius. Uh, but I want to make sure that it actually made it on chain. So we have a, a resolve uh, call. Uh, you give it a DID, uh, then it looks on chain in the DID registry contract for that DID and grabs the associated URL. And that URL should be pointing to where the metadata lives. And yeah. And here we can take a look at the complete uh, compute service that we defined earlier. So the service has a type, in this case, it's compute. And the service endpoint, so when you buy the service and actually want to execute an algorithm, uh, what is the endpoint to use for that? And that's, of course, pointing to a Breathal instance that we have running. And then these are the attributes uh, that describe the compute service here. And in addition to 
the compute service attributes uh, relating to the actual running, like the, the resources. Uh, this describes the on-chain uh, agreement or service agreement. Okay, so now we have that asset uh, registered along with the, with the compute service, and we can try to consume that. Um, so I have a, an algorithm example, a simple Python algorithm just uh, goes through the data and creates some statistical uh, information. And here we have the option of uh, first, uh, publishing the algorithm as a new asset, uh, which is different than a data set uh, asset. So there's uh, an algorithm type as well. So we can publish the algorithm as an asset. And then when we uh, run the algorithm, we can just refer to it by the DID of the algorithm. Uh, in this case, we're not doing that. I'm just gonna go run uh, uh, that algorithm as, as just uh, the code itself will be sent to the Brito endpoint. Um, of course, we need to know some information about the algorithm. So we have to uh, provide this information here. And the algorithm itself, the code is uh, in, in uh, raw code. And anyone can go uh, to datascience.oceanprotocol.com and try it out themselves. And of course, you can do anything you want there. You can write your own algorithm uh, publish your own data and, and see how it all works. So now we can uh, purchase the data set or we call it order. Uh, Here is the DID that I have from before and using my consumer account and uh, specifying the provider address. This automatically submits the payment uh, from the consumer account uh, using Ocean tokens. So token transfer here was successful. Uh, the lock reward condition is fulfilled as well. And now the Breatho uh, agent uh, listening to the events uh, should, uh, should fulfill the, the next condition. And that will allow us to request the service. So here I'm just verifying that the agreement uh, was actually created. And then I can uh, also verify that the payment is there. And this is the part of the provider that they have to fulfill. And it is successful. So now we could just go ahead and uh, and run the algorithm. And for that, we use ocean compute dot uh, start, uh, referring to the agreement ID that we just uh, ordered, and um, of course the ID of the data set uh, using our consumer account and submitting that algorithm. And that will return a job ID that we can use to uh, query the status of the running uh, job. So here it's just starting up. And it's just a matter of waiting for, for the job to complete. And then we'll be able to see the URL of, of the result and, uh, and the logs as well. Uh, yeah, this is not a long uh, algorithm. It should be done in a couple of minutes. We 
could take questions if there is any questions uh, that come up while waiting here. Hey, Samer. Um, I ask now if there are any specific questions. You can post them in the comment section or uh, using ask a feature, ask a question feature. Okay, someone just ran it and it worked. Let me see if we have relevant questions for you. Um, maybe Alex will, I will actually also invite Alex to the screen again so he can also help with answering questions. Just a second. Alex, I'm inviting you back. So there's a question, is there a process for accessing multiple data sets uh, or data assets to run on a single algorithm? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, already answer to that. We are working on on that. Uh, it should be the first uh, new feature of V two. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Then there is a long, interesting question. Let me see if I, if we can ask it. European Commission highlighted seven key requirements for AI. <clears throat> Some of them are like technical robustness, privacy, and data governance. Is the one related to ocean? With Ocean, we do not need these requirements to AI, to AI as Ocean Protocol solves these issues. Am I right? Um, I can try a little bit. So you could say the data Ocean builds the infrastructure for end users or let's say providers to address issues around privacy and data governance. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, these requirements are gone. They still need to be implemented, and then we need to create trust in the, these approaches because they're really new, and maybe there are a total of 100 people on the planet who know both about blockchain and privacy-preserving machine learning. So it's a very cutting-edge space. Um, I think we should work as we are, for example, with a program like IIX. We should work with different... Um, government and uh, private uh, alliances to, to, to create trust in these new approaches. Alex, do you have anything to add to this one? No, I, I think you, you had a good answer. Okay. Oh. There's one from Alex uh, <clears throat> Winius. Uh, can you connect other blockchain developments to the Ocean Token? Uh, in other words, can I mix the work that Sableer is doing with Ocean Token? I think I know what Sableer is, and I ask him to explain. So he's, he's saying, can I make a payment stream with Ocean Tokens? If Sableer does it with DAI, why not with Ocean Token? Uh, yeah. Alex, do you feel you can answer this? I think what they're saying is Sableer is a tool that you can use to pay, for example, uh, freelancers with streaming tokens instead of paying one off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, after all, uh, Ocean Protocol should work with any EVM-compatible blockchain. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and as long as you have a token bridge, so you can transfer Ocean tokens from and to uh, ETH mainnet, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it should work. Okay. And then there's another one. By the way, Samer, do you want us to go back to your demo? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, finished. Um, mm -hmm. You can see here the results. Uh, there is the log mm -hmm. file, and this one is the the result file, which is the summary, like I said. So we can download that and then look at it. Got it, got it. Um... Yep. By the way, do we have tutorials? Maybe Manan is also with us, uh, our... His, on our ecosystem team. So do we have tutorials specifically for the Python interface or if people want to set up something like this themselves? Tutorial for data science? Yeah. yeah. I guess this here is the tutorial. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, the link is datascience.oceanprotocol.com, and then it's uh, S05, Compute Data. If you scroll up, actually, you see there is also some text. So this is actually a tutorial within a Jupyter notebook. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, you could also go to Manterey um, repository mm -hmm. and Ocean Protocol. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we'll share the links here. Uh, Alex, there's another question from Robin. Uh, is the same staking mechanism plan for algorithm data types so that these can be staked as well? Yeah, yeah, of course. It doesn't matter if, it, if it's just an asset or an algorithm. Mm -hmm. Data set or algorithm. Yeah, okay. data, data set or algorithm, yeah. Okay. And and then uh, you can also build your own uh, layer three applications or platforms using a different staking approaches. For example, this uh, algo rank bounty running now on Git Exchange, Git Point. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's one of the ways we just try to describe like a blueprint for creating a staking on algorithms. Uh, thanks, Samer, for sharing the link to Mantere. Uh, I'll try to uh, invite. Uh, Santiago to screen. Uh, Samer, anything from your side? Any advice for life or data science and in general everything? <laughs> no, everything is perfect. Yeah, thanks, okay. everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Alex, you can stay for a moment and let's invite Santiago. Poor Santiago. He woke up at 6 a.m. I think he's in Ecuador. And I'm inviting him. Thank, really appreciate Santiago for taking the time to join us. I'm sure it's worth it. Hello. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, oh you're just a second. I'm wearing the Ocean Protocol <laughs> T-shirt <laughs> today hey, hey. for my presentations so uh just let me share my screen now where did you get the t-shirt by the way i don't think we've met in person uh, no i have applied to the ambassadors program last year so uh -huh. i went through a different pro process and mm -hmm. finally got this amazing t-shirt yeah awesome great <laughs> so um i'll remove myself from the screen <laughs> at least my video you can start presenting your site. I think you will tell us a little bit about what the demo is and and how you, you're using Ocean DP. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I'll highlight your presentation. Okay. okay. Stage is yours. Hello everyone, I'm Santiago, uh, I'm from Ecuador, and today I'm gonna present you a little a working demo on how to use uh, the Ocean B2 features uh, to ensure access to data in the healthcare domain. Um, so nowadays, uh, the healthcare uh, data is generally uh, unavailable or sitting in silos, which becomes an, an issue that uh, problem sol solvers or, or let's say the, the research, um, commu research communities uh, usually face when trying to get access to the required worldwide patient data that is so crucial to create accurate and generalizable uh, AI models. Um, thanks to the new Ocean B2 computed data features, um, um, this, uh, the healthcare uh, industry in general will be able to allow data owners to reduce the friction, uncertainty, and the lack of trust of the current data economy and flourish a new one where that generates value while ensuring that their data is nev will never be exposed or, or copied. So for example, uh, by enabling the execution of these um, computer data fe uh, features or, or in other words, uh, uh, so the, uh, some kind of decentralized machine learning workflows or data science pipelines, in the healthcare domain, uh, this will allow uh, to reduce uh, one of the main uh, bottlenecks uh, in, in the, uh, for example, in the disease uh, research uh, um, field, um, and mostly on rare uh, disease areas where the data collection and acquisition itself poses a, a critical challenge for 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 researchers. So this is a brief uh, overview of the agenda of my of what we are going to see today in my demo. Um, so let me talk about a little bit about the scenario of, of the demo I um, work for today's live stream. Um, 
So for this demo, I'm going to present you a single working use case that will allow you to understand how to how you can integrate these compute to the data features from Ocean Protocol on your own data assets and uh, decentralized apps or the apps. Um, also, you're going to learn how. Uh, um, well, in this uh, for this demo, we will not, we will not, you're going to learn how people and organizations in general can. Um, start a publishing um, compute uh, workflows that will allow consumers to um, to get interactive charts of for in this case for real time covid-19 virus of the of the spread of the uh, of the covid-19 virus virus using ocean protocol uh, compute the data features uh, so let's imagine that uh, that a public health institution or hospital Hold medical records that with tons of, of patients' uh, information, or, or in other words, personally uh, identifiable information, uh, which are held on silos due, due to they are not pro, uh, proper. These uh, uh, institutions that are not properly incentivized to share it, or they need to comply with regulations on their on their own jurisdictions. Um, on the other hand, there's the scientific community, citizens and problem solvers in general that require access to some parts or chunks of this data, but don't have the means to do so. So how can we integrate the Ocean B2 uh, new features in order to solve these, these kind of, of problems? Uh, with ocean, with this, uh, with computer data features, uh, the healthcare industry, the patients around the globe, uh, will be able to join the new data economy by publishing their own data or and computing services through the ocean decentralized and trustless protocol uh, in a secure manner and without sacrificing their privacy. So, how can in this case uh, um, the uh, a healthcare institution or hospital could publish uh, uh, computing services for this to to allow people to, or consumers to download these interactive charts. So, in this case, uh, the, the hospital will publish uh, the, an, an asset on the protocol, and will also add a white listed uh, algorithm or models or data science pipeline um, within these data assets um, to so everyone everyone that can that wants to consume this um, this compute job will be able to get results uh, over the the data of of the hospital and without any access of, of uh, we are having to to download or copy the the, the, the asset in itself so this algorithm will run on in, within the, the the infrastructure of their of the data provider, in this case, the will be a hospital. Um, so to get the statistics and charge reports of these medical records, in this case, for to get the uh, uh, an overview of the how the the COVID nineteen virus has spread around the globe, um, they will uh, um, consumers will be able to discover these compute assets through a data marketplace. For, in, for will be in this case, uh, let's say there will be a, a healthcare um, a data marketplace, or a, a more um, like a research-based uh, marketplace for for this uh, kind of domain. So, um, so the people consuming the asset will send a request through the protocol. That that will be processed by the bridge so, uh, instance or operator service that is. Uh, Maintained by, by the, in this case, by the, uh, the data owner or the hospital. Then uh, this compute job will be orchestrated on their own cloud or their premises you, uh, through the operator engine uh, component. And then uh, the the results will be sent back to the to the consumers. Um, in this case, again through the data marketplace and Ocean in this in this case take uh, um, works as a trustless and decentralized uh, protocol that ensures that all these um, 
um, uh, service execution agreements are uh, being executed and um, and um, successfully. Okay, so one of the benefits of doing this for data providers is that that, that is, for example, that they can demonstrate the quantity or quality of their asset. Uh, they can contribute with public stats or inference without com uh, compromising the privacy of the whole data set. And on the other hand, for consumers, they will have uh, access to real-time statistics about the data sets, uh, either paid or free, uh, or free. And also they can ensure that the data set is relevant for modeling their own uh, machine learning uh, algorithms or in case of people that want to let uh, for example curate the that the the, the underlying da data sets uh, within the protocol okay so for this demo um, um, that i'm going to present you you can find the the different uh files of my data science pipeline that i defined in this github repository um, so I work with a time series based uh, data set that summarizes the worldwide COVID-19 cases. It includes uh, 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 confirmed, the, the total number of confirmed deaths and recovered uh, patients around the globe. And, it, and the, uh, one of the um, characteristics of this data set is that it is constant, constantly updated. So everyone who is consuming this who wants to consume this um, compute service through the protocol or uh, will be able to get like the most recent uh, data from uh, or statistics from um, from this data set so here's the data pipeline that i defined so to start i created um I started working. Uh, I well, I created a, a Jupyter notebook that will that, that will load the data that uh, that is uh, defined or and published in the protocol. Then it it performs some uh, data cleaning tasks, some feature engineering, and at the end, it will plot some um, useful um, uh, data visualizations charts that. Um, of interest for for the consumers without uh, and that will be a uh, output to the consumer and the out, uh, and so the data uh, will never leave their premises so after defining my um, my data my jupyter notebook uh, flow i embedded in embedded it on a on a docker container and deploy it in this case in the case for this demo on a public uh, Docker registry. On the other hand, I also defined an algorithm entry point that will uh, that also will be published on as an asset in, on, on the ocean on the on an ocean marketplace. Uh, this um, script will be in charge of executing the Jupyter notebook and outputting and and generating the output that will be sent back to the to the consumer. So when a, a, a consumer uh, makes a request for this asset, the operator engine uh, will uh, pull both the, the the Docker image that I that I created and also the algorithm entry point. Then it will orchestrate a workflow or a pod on their on their Kubernetes cluster. And after finishing uh, running the uh, the algorithm it will publish the the in this case a data visualization presentation uh, an interactive database presentation for the consumer okay so one of the this here's a list that i use for this demo in this case i use like uh, this covid 19 data set that was published by the john hopkins university um I, I have also created, as I already mentioned, uh, a custom Docker image for for this for for this use case, which is based, which basically uh, inherits or it is based on 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 Jupyter Labs um, Docker images. 
And finally, I have also published my algorithm script on 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 a on GitHub GIST as a GitHub GIST, so it can be published. It is publicly available for everyone if you want to um, um, replicate this this example. On the other hand, uh, my team, me and my my other uh, team co uh, members have created this um, cool. Uh, um, CLI tool that, that will allow the Ocean Protocol community to create a React-based ocean-powered uh, decentralized app with one single command. So you will only need to install Yarn on your machines and then create and then run this uh, Yarn create ocean app. You uh, you can specify as a template name the Ocean B2, and you and you will get a boilerplate code. So so you can start inter. Uh, Interactive with the computer, the data features uh, right uh, in just a few clicks. Okay, so now I'm going to ch show you a live demo. Um, Can you see my screen now? Okay. So for this demo, I'm going to show you who, um, the workflow of, of um, publishing an asset and adding, uh, in this case, uh, a computing algorithm, attaching a computing algorithm to, to this asset. To a wide, uh, so it can be white listed by the provider and can be consumed um, by the people. Uh, okay, so in this case, I'm gonna create a COVID-19 database report. Uh, here's some descriptions about the data set. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the, the, the first step for, for creating a new asset. Uh, so I'm gonna create a, a, a data set with this name. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna make it free, for free access. Uh, this data asset is going to have uh, three data files, and I'm going to I want to uh, provide a compute service uh, that is going to be white listed with uh, in this data set. So here I'm specifying like a name of the algorithm, a brief description, I'm uh, specifying in this case uh, the Docker content image that will be uh, pulled and executed. Um, and the entry point are for to execute this the in this case the algorithm script that I'm going to specify here. I'm going to specify below, which is the the gist for my uh, Python script. Here's some, some uh, additional metadata information for the asset. And now I'm going to publish it. Need to sign the agreement, um, execute the transaction on change, on chain. Uh, so I first I publish I first publish my my algorithm on the protocol, uh, on, on the marketplace, and then I'm going to publish the the data asset. Uh, So I finished publishing my asset. Now I'm going to search it here, and here, here it is. Here's my da my data set, and also my compute algorithm that I attached to to this data set. So I'm going to see details, and now I'm going to execute the compute service. So now I need to execute a transaction on chain. In this case, the, uh, the asset is free and there is the job has started on, on, the, on the compute provider. We can see here the status of the current uh, workflow that is running.
just publishing the results. And there it is, the job has finished. So here's the um, quick links for, so you can download the, the results for this uh, compute job. You can download the logs and the actual output of my data science pipeline. So now I'm going to download the results and open them. And now you can see The actual output in this case is a, um, a an HTML present presentation slides where you can see in this case some we do some data exploration and see in the, uh, for example the total confirmed uh, um, number of people that is uh, infected currently infect, that has been reported as infected the total confirmed and deaths up to date until today. And also the, the, a report of new cases and daily new deaths. Uh, and in this case, I'm gonna present, uh, it also presents uh, how the, the, the coronavirus has been uh, spread uh, around certain countries. For example, we have a, here an interactive uh, chart which reports uh, the spread of the virus in, in different countries such as China, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the US. And if you want uh, to filter some of the data and see what happened at certain dates, you can filter it here, right in the report. So this is an easy and straightforward way to present like um, uh, the main statistics about this data set to the consumer without exposing the, the, the data set itself. So it is run and executed and delivered to the consumer without, uh, with, uh, with privacy, with preser while preserving the privacy of the, of, the, of the asset itself. And I think that's it from my side. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We can go back to video. <clears throat> for a bit, okay. if you want. Okay. Uh, really appreciate all the time you time you put in equating this. Uh, by the way, your video is black. I don't know why. Um, let me see. I'll re-enable your video. I hope it works. Oh my! And, yeah, we have a my cam cover. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you still have your cover? Oh, that's a very advanced security feature. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it's okay. So, Santiago, just want to check something. The <clears throat> UI elements that you showed were based on our previous, I think, hackathon mount bounty. Was it the scaffold thing or it's something else? Sorry? Uh, the, the UI that you had for V2, was it based on the Dragon Quest uh, bounty that we had last month? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we started uh, we in draw, um, working in this uh, boilerplate templates called uh, CLI tool mm -hmm. for the Dragon Quest hackathon. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was for the B1, uh, for Ocean B1. Yeah, so uh -huh. now we have created a new um, template so mm -hmm. people can start working with the Ocean B2 new features right away. Yeah, in just a few, a few comments. Yeah. Okay, okay. Huge kudos coming to you guys. And I, I think we have to work together with our ecosystem team to maybe have a workshop just uh, about this so we can uh, teach people how to use it. And uh, I think you maybe you could also share the Gitcoin uh, repos with us, the links later here. Um, yeah. 
one of the things I really liked that you mentioned in your presentation was that um, this different approach of using uh, computer data where let's say you you want to get the same data on a daily basis so in this case the algorithms or the pipelines they could be pre-approved by data providers they update the data set but then they're they're sure that this is the same thing running so it's not like a different uh, pipeline every time I think this could be very useful in uh, these scenarios where Data providers have very sensitive data, but they're okay with sharing some anonymized or some parts of it uh, with uh, either paid or unpaid um, people who want to buy it, get access. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, thanks again for showing us the demo. This is being recorded, so if you're more curious about you know, going through the steps, uh, um, you can rewatch after the session is finished. And uh, yeah, I hope Santiago can just post the GitHub repo for us here, the link, so people can get access to that. Um, one final, uh, let's say, call to action from our side. We're right now uh, in a, a member or a sponsor of the Gitcoin Radical Exchange or Git Exchange Hackathon. We have two bounties related to data and algorithms, so you can hack on those. But in a few weeks, I think uh, starting, let me just check for a second, uh, June 15th, so in less than two weeks, we're joining a couple of really reputable companies in the privacy blockchain space. Uh, for example, Zcash and NewCypher, Heat Network. And uh, with them, we're launching a new hackathon in collaboration with Bitcoin called, I think that they protect privacy hackathon. Uh, so if you feel now is a little bit late for you to submit to the current hackathon, you still have about like five days, you can join the next one. Um, also, if you would like to join our community, you can join port, port.oceanprotocol.com. Uh, just tell us a little bit about what you're doing and then someone from the ecosystem team or our community of ambassadors, they will reach out to you. Um, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, Trent, uh, Alex, Samer, and Santiago for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this. It was very um, informational and educational for myself. And uh, see you in the next uh, demo, technical demo session. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.